This is uh, Dr. Ramana Morthy. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, thank Orbis for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about the treatment of uveitis. Um, let me try to share my slides here with you um, and we can start. Um, the um, the uh, program today will really focus um, on the um, uh, basically the treatment of non-infectious uveitis, but I will say so a few words on infectious uveitis because there are several questions that I've already gotten about uveitis. You know, the key here is, of course, when we start a treatment of inflammatory disease, we have to know the underlying cause. We have to make sure that it's non-infectious. And how do we know that? Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we take chances because we have done testing to rule out the most common inflammatory causes of um, infectious causes, excuse me, of inflammation. And these include, of course, uh, syphilis, tuberculosis. In some selected cases, we may rule out bartonellosis. We may rule out um, the uh, 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 other pathogens, uh, such as uh, in bacterial or fungal or viral pathogens, viral uveitis, based on the clinical appearances as we discussed in the previous lecture two weeks ago. Once we have effectively ruled out those causes, then the treatment of non-infectious uveitis can really begin uh, full force. But until then, um, it is probably of little risk to start treatment uh, of inflammatory disease, at least with strong or potent topical and um, steroidal medications before we consider more aggressive steroid therapy because we don't know what the uh, inflammatory disease may be. In posterior uveitis, that presents a bigger conundrum or dilemma. So um, if there is an infectious component to the inflammatory disease, we have to make sure that we have to control that infectious component first and start the patient on antimicrobials and then begin corticosteroid therapy aggressively. Without appropriate antimicrobial therapy, infectious uveitis gets worse. The paradigm, the treatment of non-infectious uveitis is to basically control inflammation, control cells in the anterior chamber, control vitreous cells, and hopefully as a result of doing that, you can eliminate the risk of vision loss from structural and functional complications resulting from that inflammation. So you have to consider that specific diagnosis, consider if there is any other underlying systemic disease. Does the patient have juvenile idiopathic arthritis? Do they have uh, a systemic vasculitis that's causing their necrotizing scleritis. These kinds of things will make a big difference in terms of the choice of agents and your approach to the treatment. Um, you also look at the patient's existing level of ocular function. Obviously, if the patient is 20-20 with no visual symptoms and chronic mild anterior uveitis with no structural damage to the eye, how you're going to treat that patient is going to be milder and much not as aggressive as perhaps somebody who has a, a significant vision loss, structural complications such as cystoid macroedema and severe anterior segment and vitreous inflammation. Now remember, uh, there are some exceptions to those generalized rules. For example, children may present with excellent vision with JIA-associated uveitis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis-associated uveitis. They have no symptoms and white, quiet, white-looking eyes, but then anterior segment may show two-plus cells, and they may have severe structural complications with 20-20 vision. So chronic disease can be much more difficult to, uh, to uh, control, not only because it's difficult to control to begin with, but because it's hard to convince the patient, hey, you have problems and we need to uh, take care of this before you get into uh, more trouble with complications from the inflammation. The initial goal of any therapy, especially for acute disease, is to control inflammation rapidly, but that same goes for chronic disease. So how do you do that? Corticosteroids are the most effective agents with, with a few exceptions. Those exceptions probably include the cases where you have explosive onset ocular Bechet's disease. In those cases, Bechet's disease we treat with anti-TNF therapy, usually with Remicade infusions if it is available. Remicade is infliximab, a monoclonal antibody directed against uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, Fortunately, this is widely available in Western Europe and, and the United States, and in some portions, portions of East Asia, it may be much more difficult to obtain uh, in sub-Saharan African countries. But regardless, I think that these agents, such as infliximab, have their own niche role to play, um, and they can be effective agents, as we'll discuss, 
or even more recalcitrant disease. But corticosteroids are typically used topically, regionally, and systemically. The multicenter uveitis steroid treatment trial or MUST trial is a very uh, important trial to remember because this showed the effectiveness of uh, corticosteroids, specifically the corticosteroid implant or the flustone implant. At 54 months follow-up, um, in the most recent publication of the MUST trial, it was clear that there are some specific advantages and disadvantages to both the systemic therapy as well as the local therapy. And it turned out that the main advantage to local therapy was fewer systemic side effects, but both appeared to have equal efficacy in terms of maintaining vision, control, and controlling inflammation. The fluosilone implant, or the Redisert implant, that is utilized for the treatment of uveitis in many places, is very expensive. Um, it is uh, extremely expensive to buy out of pocket, obviously. It costs about fifteen dollars to $18,000 in the United States to obtain this implant. Um, and, uh, but this implant lasts for three years. It's very effective in controlling inflammation. But 40% the, but of patients who get this implant get glaucoma. Everybody gets a cataract who has it. So you're guaranteeing that patient that when they will have at least two surgeries, or at least one surgery, maybe 1.4 surgeries in their future while they have this implant. So this is something to consider in patients who have uveitis. Remember, these kinds of surgical interventions can be very difficult. Um, sometimes mild scleritis or episcleritis can be treated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. We're not going to spend much time on those today, but there are some conditions where steroid sparing immunosuppressive therapy in non-infectious uveitis is, is, should be considered very early. A chest disease, as I mentioned, with vision threatening involvement, the posterior segment especially, sympathetic ophthalmia, necrotizing scleritis, especially if there is systemic vasculitis associated with this, and serpiginous scleritis uh, with uh, foveal threatening and involvement. Um, and of course, birdshot, retinochoridopathy, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, Votkoyanagi Harada syndrome, these are all the usual suspects, as I call them, for initiation of steroid sparing immunosuppressive therapy. When we start patients on steroids, we start them at high doses and taper very gradually. One of the questions that I had um, pre-meeting was, how do you know, how, how, when do you start tapering the um, steroids once the inflammation is controlled? Well, the key is to get that inflammation controlled at high doses. And once, for example, and I'll talk about anterior uveitis as an example. If somebody has three plus cells on presentation in the anterior chamber, you start them on every hour pred prednisolone uh, acetate drops uh, or you start them on every two hour Durazol or diflupredinate drops and get the inflammation rapidly controlled, the next step would be to, uh, over the course of the first two weeks, use that very frequent interval, and then every two weeks decrease the dosing based on the response. Generally, when we use free steroids so frequently, we get rapid control of the anterior segment inflammation, and then we can start tapering the, the medication. But the key is to do a slow taper and start tapering once you have the inflammation controlled at the highest dose possible. And that may sound uh, aggressive, but you need to be aggressive in acute disease to control it rapidly and then begin taper. And taper, even for acute uveitis, most acute anterior uveitis cases last eight to 12 weeks. If you're tapering patients off of steroids in less, period, less time than that, you are probably under treating a vast majority of those patients and the risk of developing recurrences and chronic disease is significant. And once, as you taper the medications, you're going to keep in mind the complications of topical steroids if you're overutilizing them, that is intraocular pressure elevation and glaucoma. In the case of systemic steroids, we have other considerations that we have to consider, um, the, like uh, bone loss and chronic, in, in when we're using chronic uh, low doses of oral prednisone, we have the issue of uh, bone loss or calcium loss from bone and thinning of bones, osteopenia and osteoporosis development is one complication, but there are myriad of system, uh, systemic association with systemic steroids that I'll talk about in a moment. If the control isn't achieved with initial therapy, second line therapy is usually transitioned to fairly quickly. And second line therapy is really used uh, when chronic disease cannot be controlled as a safe dose of corticosteroids. If somebody still has active inflammation and they're religiously using their prednisolone drops every hour and they're on 60 milligrams of prednisone and they still have, after two weeks of such therapy, significant inflammation, we have to be very cautious 
uh, and in terms of how aggressive we are at that time, at that point to control inflammation. The possibilities here include, of course, that you've made the wrong diagnosis and you have an inflammatory condition that you uh, that that you don't uh, that you don't have uh, appropriately diagnosed, which is probably unlikely. But more than likely, you have a very severe inflammatory condition that's just not responding to a, a corticosteroid therapy alone. So. Uh, in these cases, uh, you're going to be looking especially for long-term use of steroid sparing agents. There are multiple drug classes that we'll talk about, and the selection of agent is really empiric, in my opinion, although there are certain considerations such as systemic disease that will help you make the final choice. Uh, the anti-metabolites, uh, such as methotrexate, azathioprine, and mycophenolate, are the most commonly used uh, agents for uveitis management. Um, and then, of course, the calcineurin inhibitors, uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, are also utilized. Alkylating agents are reserved for the worst diseases, um, cyclophosphamide and chlorambucil. And, of course, the biologic response modifiers are finding an increasing role, especially with the recent FDA uh, approval in the United States of adalimumab or Humira for the treatment of non-infectious intermediate posterior and panuveitis. The... Beyond second line therapy, sometimes we use combination therapy. Occasionally, we may perform surgical interventions, such as a therapeutic slash diagnostic parse plane of vitrectomy uh, in patients who have severe vitritis that seems to be unresponsive to therapy. Pregnancy and utilize, utilization of this in women of childbearing age, and of course, in men also uh, who are interested in uh, having children, we have to consider uh, specifically about the issues of sterility in men, and of course, the uh, potential risk to the fetus uh, in, in pregnancy, and this may also alter our choice of agents. Uh, vaccinations uh, in patients who, have, who are under immunosuppressive therapy, we have to be cautious about as well, because we should avoid live virus vaccine in anybody who's receiving anti-TNF therapy. And for that matter, I would do this in anybody who's receiving any immunomodulatory therapy for the treatment of uveitis. Any live virus vaccines such as varicella zoster, polio, rabies, influenza vaccine made with live virus, the nasal influenza vaccine. So um, we'll start now with talking initially about topical cycloplegics, which I think are overlooked. Uh, this is, uh, may sound like a mundane topic, but anytime I see patients who have anterior chamber involvement, I will use cycloplegics. If the anterior chamber involvement is mild with uh, mild cellular uh, inflammation, I generally use something that is mild midriatic or um, uh, cycloplegic agent such as midriacil or cyclogil or cyclopentylate. However, if the inflammation is very severe with fibrin, hypopian development, and the, the patient already has fairly dense fibrinous synechia formation, we need to lyse those synechia. So I will put those patients on atropine 1% drops or uh, hyacin is another option. Um, the other possibility, of course, uh, is to, um, uh, in addition to that, in the office, um, use a uh, cotton-tipped applicator or pledget soaked with uh, uh, topical phenylephrin, 2.5%, um, 1% uh, midriacil, 1% to 2% cyclogel, and just very gently in an anesthetized uh, eye, place the Q-tip uh, or pledget at the edge of the limbus where the synechia are to try to break them. Now, if the synechia are fibrotic and look very chronic and they've been there for years, they're not going to break for you. Uh, but those associated with acute disease will, and those need to be treated aggressively. So you need to break recently formed synechia. That's the reason we use them. If somebody's allergic to them, we don't use uh, these medications, obviously. And we also check the ankle depth to make sure that the patient is not going to develop angle closure um, as a result of the use of these agents. Um, the dosages are adjusted according to the desired duration effect and, the, uh, and also based on how um, uh, the severe the inflammation is. And these uh, medications are listed in order of duration of activity here. Atropine lasts the longest, can last up to two weeks uh, once you give a drop, uh, as can scopolamine. Homatropine lasts about two to five days. Cyclopentylate uh, lasts about 12, uh, 24 hours or so. Tropicamide about 12 hours. Um, and really, you have to monitor the pupil size, and when you're monitoring the effectiveness of therapy of these patients, you need to look at the structural complications of the anterior segment in anterior uveitis. Look at the synechia. Mon uh, document exactly where the synechia are in clock hours or by a drawing and follow them because sometimes you can see creeping synechia formation and you may not recognize that the disease is um, uh, 
is not well controlled. Uh, you may think that it is and it's not, and you're seeing progressive sneaky formation indicating that the, there's ongoing chronic inflammation. There are complications from cycloplegic psychosis, especially uh, from atropine is more common in the pediatric age group and the very elderly. Tachycardia, fever, urinary retentions, which are anti-muscarinic side effects that are common with, especially with atropine or uh, 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 hyacin, um, uh, the uh, scopolamine. Uh, they can cause blurred vision, of course, and temporary use of reading glasses may be necessary. Um, and sometimes we get into the unlucky situation where we give an atropine to the patient to dilate the pupil, and the pupil's widely dilated, but their inflammation is not well controlled, and they develop synechia, and the pupil is left stuck wide open. And in order to avoid that, once you get the inflammation, the severe inflammation well controlled on atropine, I switch the patients over when they have milder you know, anterior segment inflammation left to something like cyclogel so we don't get into that problem. That's rarely an issue, but that can happen. Um, corticosteroids are the mainstay for the treatment of um, non-infectious ocular inflammatory disease, but they're also included as adjunctive therapy for infectious conditions after the infection has been treated, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and, um, it's, you know, especially when there's uh, an inflammatory component to infectious disease, treat the infection first and 24 to 48 hours after the initiation of systemic uh, and or local antibiotic therapy, you can then start corticosteroid therapy. You should not use corticosteroids alone for the treatment of infectious uveitis ever. There was a question about toxoplasmosis treatment, et cetera. Um, I will kind of mention in passing the treatment of infectious conditions, but let me just stay here, say here for the record, For there were two questions. One was on toxoplasmosis treatment. Toxoplasma, uh, retinochoroiditis, I usually will still rely on the classic uh, uh, triad, uh, a triple therapy of using sulfadiazine uh, combined with uh, oral pyrimethamine combined with oral prednisone. Usually I will start the pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine first. Now pyrimethamine has been, uh, uh, has uh, been in Daraprim has uh, had a significant controversy in the United States because of uh, a lone pharmaceutical co um, uh, company buying up uh, the rights to distribute uh, the medication and charging exorbitant amounts of money. Um, if pyrimethamine is not um, uh, readily available, uh, other options can include clindamycin, 300 milligrams QID. Usually I will use um, these agents, um, uh, the, um, and the other, another option could be azathioprine, uh, 250 milligrams to uh, BID to 500 milligrams Q day. That could be utilized as well, um, along with corticosteroids. Uh, once the anti-toxoplasm uh, medication is started. Um, the treatment is usually given for a six to eight week period. I can all, we also use intravitreal clindamycin that can be an effective um, method of treatment between 300 to 500 micrograms and a 10th of a cc intravitreally can be utilized to uh, treat the um, toxoplasma infection. Uh, and then the other question was on cat scratch disease. Uh, forgive me for digressing. I'm just going to get those questions out of the way. But cat scratch disease or bartonellosis, I usually will use doxycycline at 100 milligrams BID. And I will treat uh, usually between four to six weeks in duration. Sometimes I use corticosteroids a few days after starting the um, uh, oral uh, uh, antibiotic. So let's move on here. So there are contraindications for the corticosteroids I mentioned, and mainly infections. So treat the infection first and then start corticosteroids. People who have uh, pre-existing peptic ulcers or erosive gastritis, uh, those are relative contraindications. Uh, poorly controlled diabetics, um, uh, definitely a contraindication to corticosteroids. Um, and elevation of intraocular pressure just means that you have to monitor those patients very carefully because corticosteroids obviously will cause intraocular pressure elevation. The paradigm treatment that I want to really kind of stress here is to start at high doses with frequent interval dosing of topical steroids initially, like every hour, and then gradually taper when you're dealing with anterior uveitis. Anterior uveitis is by far the most common thing that the general practitioner is going to see in their day-to-day -day practice, okay? For the intermediate uh, and the pan-uveitis uh, or posterior uveitis, in those cases, you're going to have to use periocular, intraocular corticosteroids uh, or systemic corticosteroids, depending on the uh, nature of the inflammatory disease process and patient factors. And if you do do oral corticosteroids, you need to use prednisone at about a milligram per kilogram per day. Usually that means about 60 to 80 milligrams daily. Um, uh, prednisone tapered gradually over a period of 
minimum of six to 12 weeks with a maintenance uh, regimen, hopefully of less than 10 milligrams a day of prednisone. Prednisone is our um, equivalent to corticosteroids that we use in the United States. Prednisolone, uh, prednisolone acetate, is usually started hourly when we treat anterior segment inflammation and tapered every two weeks uh, by basically half. I go every one hour for two weeks, uh, every two hours for two weeks, every three hours for two weeks, very, very gradually. I usually take my time in HLA B27 associated uveitis, for example. That uveitis, most episodes last eight to 12 weeks, at least some longer, especially severe cases. And if you're tapering the patient off of steroids too quickly, you're going to guarantee that that patient is going to get chronic disease, and then it's going to be very, very difficult to control. So I, I urge um, my residents in, in our uh, university here uh, and in my practice to uh, use steroids aggressively early on if it's a non-infectious uveitis and taper gradually. You don't want to start prednisolone four times daily and then try to catch up and try to increase it because it's not responding. You want to start high, hourly drops, and then gradually taper. Durazol or diprednate is twice as potent as prednisolone, so we can use it less frequently. And it is a very effective agent. It seems to penetrate not only the anterior chamber, but it appears to get into the anterior vitreous. So in very mild cases, of, for example, intermediate uveitis that the patient has good vision and has just mild vitritis, those patients can sometimes be managed by di diflupredinate. But diflupredinate does carry with it a substantial risk of intraocular pressure elevation. Around half of patients who are on it, especially in children, intraocular pressure elevation can be quite severe on diflupredinate. And that can happen at any time, as early as two weeks after initiation of therapy, and uh, even three months or even a year after you've been using diflupredinate. So be aware of that. Taper these agents slowly. And for infectious entities, again, start systemic regional therapy only 40 hours or more after institution of appropriate antimicrobial therapy. So these are the topical agents. I was already referring to most of these. The most common things that we use in practice, as you may know, are diflupredinase and prednisolone. I use, a lot, uh, I use FML or fluoromethylone because this uh, is a very potent steroid and is uh, uh, available at very low concentrations to be almost as effective as prednisolone acetate, uh, but it tends to be a little bit more um, uh, friendly in terms of intraocular pressure elevation. It does not cause as much intraocular pressure elevation as uh, diflupredinate, certainly, and probably less than prednisolone as well. I don't use uh, topical dexamethasone very much, um, and uh, lodopredinol, uh, lodomax, and remixolone. Uh, remixolone I don't use at all. Uh, Lodopredinol may have some role uh, in the mildest of disease when I'm trying to taper the patient off of topical corticosteroids. Periocular corticosteroids, I usually use triamcinolone, a um, longer duration corticosteroid, about uh, 20 to 40 milligrams usually, uh, 20 milligrams in pediatric patients and about 40 milligrams in adult patients. These I often repeat uh, every two to three weeks or so, um, uh, and these can be given uh, multiple times uh, around each eye, depending on the response to inflammation and depending on the patient developing intraocular pressure elevation. And the intraocular pressure elevation, once you give subtenons uh, or retroceptal corticosteroids, can be very difficult to manage because uh, those patients, if they have severe response, may end up needing surgery for glaucoma because you, it's very difficult to go back in and remove the corticosteroids. I've done that before, uh, going and actually do a tenonectomy and remove the corticosteroids to try to reduce their steroid response. Uh, that's a desperate measure. Um, often these patients just go on to see a glaucoma specialist and uh, undergo gla appropriate glaucoma management. Intraocular steroids, I usually use preservative-free triamcinolone. That should say preservative-free triamcinolone, four milligrams and a tenth of a cc, but smaller doses can be utilized uh, with fairly effective uh, treatment. You can use one, two, or up to four milligrams and a tenth of a cc. Um, of course, we can give intraocular antibiotics and VEGF inhibitors as well, along with corticosteroids. Um, as for example, as I alluded to with, uh, with toxoplasma therapy, I will usually give, in these cases of toxoplasmosis, I will not use triamcinolone because it's a long-acting steroid. I will use clindamycin uh, intravitrally and usually use dexamethasone with it because it's a short-acting agent. 
Um, I avoid, try to avoid uh, using triamcinolone uh, in cases where there's infectious posteriuveitis because intravitreal triamcinolone can make things much worse uh, because you can have uncontrolled in, uh, infectious uh, disease, as I showed you with the toxoplasmosis last two weeks ago, uh, where you can have severe necrotized uh, retinitis developing. Um, and also the same goes for viral uh, uh, her, not, necrotizing herpetic retinitis. Avoid using intravitreal corticosteroids. Uh, I just don't do that. I think, uh, you know, if you want to use corticosteroids, use systemic, once the antivirals, uh, systemic antivirals have been on board for a few days. Um, the triamcinolone is the main agent. I use depomedrol or methylprednisolone assays also available as a depot for periocular. And again, I mentioned uh, the shorter acting agents I, I do not use for as, as periocular injections. Uh, the, this is another recapitulation of the same thing. This is how I give a retroceptal, uh, or excuse me, a posterior septenons injection using the Nozick technique. Uh, Rob, Bob Nozick uh, uh, was the first to describe this technique um, more than four decades ago. Uh, 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 and uh, I use a 25 gauge uh, short uh, 5 eighths inch needle on a 3 cc syringe with about 1 cc of uh, triamcinolone or canalog where we've drawn up 40 milligrams and a tenth of a cc in the adult patient. Um, here is a patient receiving a retroceptal injection. I use a 27 gauge on half inch needle. Uh, Dr. Steve Foster was the one that kind of turned me on to using this. It's, uh, using a 27 gauge needle is minimally painful. Uh, 25 can hurt more when you're going through the skin. So 25 uh, or 27, excuse me, doesn't hurt as much. And I basically penetrate, go straight back, penetrate the orbital septum and inject retroceptally. You will get a little festoon uh, underneath the lid from the, uh, from the steroid injection. Intravitrially, uh, there are many options now. In addition to intravitreal triamcinolone, I alluded to this earlier, but the flucinolone acidinide implant, which was extensively studied um, in multiple uh, clinical trials from Bausch and Lomb's so sponsored studies, as well as uh, more recently with the MUST clinical trial that I mentioned earlier, uh, conducted by the National Institutes of Health. Um, you know, that's uh, highly effective, but again, associated with significant complications that we'll get to. The dexamethasone implant, um, it's continuous release for about a month. The clinical effectiveness in uveitis for the dexamethasone implant or the Ogidex implant is probably a little less uh, than three months. Uh, I typically will see an effect for maybe two months uh, on these. So these are all methods of delivery. The, the um, Ogidex is done in the office. Illuvian, I have not talked about. It's still pending uh, approval for, by the FDA for uveitis treatment. That shows some promise in terms of being more uh, being an, as an office procedure and lasting longer, but it's not biodegradable, whereas the Ogidex is biodegradable and goes away. Um, in the case of the Redisert implant at the bottom uh, part of the screen, you'll see that these have to be surgically implanted and sutured in position. <clears throat> they may have to be removed and replaced every three years based on the severity of the inflammation. Um, Oral agents, prednisone, as I mentioned, is the, is the main one that I use. Occasionally for the most severe uveitic cases, for example, explosive onset Bechet's disease, if <coughs> infliximab is not available, I will uh, use IV methylprednisolone uh, at one gram a day, typically divided in, into three doses, um, and IV, and the patient is hospitalized for this uh, because we monitor their blood sugars, blood pressure, and other parameters, they can become very ill when they get this therapy. And then and once I've completed three days of intravenous therapy, I will switch them over to orals. And this is for the most severe cases of explosive onchet bechet associated posterior vasculitis, for example. I have done that in the past. These are the efficacies of the systemic corticosteroids. Prednisone is about four times more uh, effect, uh, potent than, uh, than hydrocortisone, and triamcinolone is about five times more, um, and so, as same as uh, methylprednisolone. All forms of corticosteroids can cause PSC cataracts and increase in trochlear pressure. Remember that. Increase in trochlear pressure in the case of, for example, periocular corticosteroids can occur at any point in the, uh, in the course of the disease process. So if you gave a corticosteroid injection periocularly to a patient six months ago, it is still possible that they can get intraocular pressure elevation. So once you commit it to that form of therapy, local therapy, it's very important to monitor the patient's intraocular pressure even after their inflammation is gone uh, or if they're in between episodes, if they have re uh, you know, recurrent disease, for example. Let me go to the first polling question before we talk about some of the side effects of steroids. Um, and the first, this question is, if a patient was treated with 
prednisone, 60 milligrams daily for, for one week for uveitis, and the prednisone dose was tapered and discontinued over a six-week period, which of the following complications would be least likely to occur? I'm sorry for the negative here, but least likely to occur during that period, during that six-week period. Weight gain, aseptic necrosis of the hip, hypertension, or mood disturbances. <coughs> And um, we'll see if the answer comes up here. This is a little bit of a trick question. You know, everybody who's on corticosteroids is going to experience some element of weight gain. They may have underlying diabetes can become worse. Uh, underlying hypertension uh, uh, can become worse. And mood disturbances are very common. Uh, but the least common of these, and the most idiosyncratic of these is, you got it, the, you, most of you got it right, which is excellent, is aseptic necrosis of the hip. This is a very serious potential complication often presenting with severe hip pain, inability to walk, and the patient will have a, a softening of the uh, femoral head, sometimes the humeral head as well in, in some cases. So uh, this can be a devastating complication requiring joint replacement uh, surgery. So this is uh, completely idiosyncratic, but tends to occur at higher doses when patients have, are on 60, uh, 40 to 60 milligrams of prednisone or higher. And so monitor for this uh, very, very carefully. There are many other um, uh, short-term complications. And I joke that corticosteroids, if there is a complication or a systemic symptom that has ever been reported, that symptom is probably listed in the physician's desk reference for side effects of corticosteroids. In other words, every side effect known to man has probably been attributed to corticosteroids. It's kind of humorous in some ways. But that also tells us that these agents, although very effective, we need to counsel our patients when we're using them systemically as to their potential risks. So I talk to patients about underlying diabetes. If they're diabetic, I really avoid using systemic corticosteroids if I can. If I have no choice, in those cases, I will have them be, uh, be aggressively monitored by their medical doctor and have them, uh, the patient also self-monitor their blood sugars. Uh, fluid retention, hypertension, worsening of heart failure, uh, it, with chronic uh, and aseptic necrosis of the hip, all those things we talked about already. Very rarely, there are patients who have hypersensitivity reactions to, uh, such as urticaria to prednisone. That's really strange and kind of paradoxical, isn't it? We often use those agents to treat allergies, but uh, I suppose that it's probably the vehicle or something in the agent that they're allergic to. Um, uh, people can, with long-term use, most seriously can develop osteoporosis, osteopenia, impaired wound healing and fragile skin. Um, some people can develop multiple recurrences of subconjunctival hemorrhage with chronic, top, chronic topical steroids, for example. So topical steroids um, can also cause uh, fragility of the conjunctival blood vessels and recurrent subconjunctival hemorrhages. I see a lot of patients who have this, who complain of this, who are on topical maintenance therapy with steroids. Uh, pancreatitis, fatty liver, there are lots of different complications that you can see in so many. I don't want to list all of these. Fast re redistribution and developing of, development of a Cushingoid state is something that we see frequently as early as two months after initiation of systemic corticosteroids. Here's another potential complication that we need to talk about. Which of the following is most likely to induce peptic ulcers? A, systemic corticosteroids. B, systemic non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. C, systemic steroids combined with non-steroidals, or D, all are equally likely to cause peptic ulcers. Again, this is a medical question. It's not a uveitis question, but it's important because we use systemic corticosteroids frequently as uveitis specialists and as ophthalmologists, and we should be aware of some of these issues. And let's see what the results show here in the poll. There we go. So we're kind of a mixed bag here. So I think 39% uh, of you said systemic uh, corticosteroids and about 30%, almost on an equal number, said e all are equally likely to cause peptic ulcers. It's interesting. Corticosteroids alone, probably uh, in the original reports, they've been associated with uh, uh, gastric ulcers and uh, GI hemorrhage, but these were probably uncontrolled studies and spurious observations. It turns out that really that Although corticosteroids can exacerbate and make worse pre-existing gastritis or peptic ulcer disease, combining corticosteroids with non-steroidals increases the risk of peptic ulcers and gastric ulcers by 10 to 20-fold. 
that was impressive. I found it is, it's well known in the medical literature. So I am very, very cautious about combining these two. So some, you may have patients with scleritis you have on steroids and they're taking non-steroidals to control pain or something. That's a bad combination, can result in a lot of problems. Those patients should be monitored carefully for the development of ulcers. And if you're going to have to use both of those agents together, I would suggest using an H2 blocker or uh, some of these other new um, 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 proton pump inhibitors, et cetera, that can be utilized for the treatment of this. Um, corticosteroids regionally can be associated with injection into the retinal or choroidal circulation, and I have seen that. That's not a good thing. Um, it's, you know, those patients can lose vision uh, and can become completely blind. Perforation of the globe, permanent loss of vision from globe perforation. Uh, Ptosis, proptosis, orbital fat atrophy are more cosmetic issues, but the orbital fat prolapse, uh, uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage or periorbital hemorrhage, uh, and then sometimes pain or syncope, et cetera, scarring from numerous injections, all these things are potential risks. And intravitreal um, risks uh, for in, in terms of the corticosteroid implants, uh, the, the retisert implant, 100% of fake patients will need cataract surgery within two years of the placement of the retisert implant. 40%, about 50% will develop glaucoma, but 40% will need surgical intervention for glaucoma within two years. Um, the good news is when you do surgery for cataract or glaucoma, when they have these implants, generally these patients tend to have good control of the inflammation already and tend to do well surgically. So this is some, something important to kind of keep in mind. Now, some patients can develop vitreous opacities or vitreous hemorrhage as well. Um, um, surgical complications such as macular edema, retinal hemorrhage, hypotony, choroidal detachments, um, inadvertent placement of the implant in the zippochoroidal space, um, retinal detachment, endophthalmitis, all these are potential risks uh, as well. Lens damage uh, at the time of insertion. Um, rarely, you it doesn't happen anymore, but the old implants used to actually dissociate, and so the cap of the implant fell off, um, and um, they needed to be explanted. Those can be very, very difficult to remove. Um, and sometimes you can have conjunctival erosions. Uh, obviously, these patients need to be monitored carefully for glaucoma and cataract progression. Uh, topical use, uh, you have to be very careful of topical corticosteroids because if you have underlying um, herpetic uh, corneal disease, you may make that worse. So you make sure that you've ruled out external infectious diseases before using topical corticosteroids. And then, um, again, increased uh, development of spontaneous subconjunctival hemorrhage. Here's the next poll question. This is about going back to systemic steroids. Again, when we use these chronically, we have to keep these in mind, but uh, which of the following tests needs to be performed for patients on long-term maintenance doses of oral prednisone less than 10 milligrams per day? Um, so a, uh, monthly um, liver function test, uh, B, monthly uh, BUN and creatinine, C, annual complete blood count, or D, annual bone density scan. Let's see if anybody's paying attention this morning. I'm sure you all are. So we have, so any time that we have somebody who's on chronic uh, systemic corticosteroid therapy, uh, no matter what dosage, even if, you know, seven and a half or, uh, you know, less than 10 milligrams a day, um, those patients need to be um, very carefully, that's good, very carefully monitored um, for the development of osteoporosis. I don't, we don't need to check liver function tests or renal functions or CBCs on patients who are on uh, chronic uh, maintenance oral prednisone therapy. Uh, what the CBC will show margination or elevation of the white blood cell count, which happens with steroids. Bune and creatinine and liver function tests usually won't be affected. Occasionally patients can get fatty liver with corticosteroids. That usually happens with the higher doses, but that's, that's very, very uncommon. So these are things to keep in mind. Um, the, um, Again, on, these, on this therapy, it's very important that the patients uh, on systemic corticosteroids be monitored carefully for blood pressure, weight, diabetes, all these things that we talked about already. And of course, long-term um, monitor bone density scanning. Uh, patients should have a total body bone density scan if that's available and be mon uh, monitored for osteoporosis. And of course, uh, topical, regional, and intravitreal corticosteroids, we need to monitor for uh, uh, the development of um, uh, interactive pressure elevation, cataract status. So um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about those really bad diseases where we need to use immunosuppressives. So serpiginous choroiditis, this is an example of a patient who has active serpiginous on the, on the slide on the right. Uh, 
in the left eye there in the superior temporal quadrant, you can see uh, there's active serpiginous choroiditis and this patient is, has juxtafoveal uh, or subfoveal involvement already and, and they've lost the other eye. The other eye is on the left. Uh, here's a patient with birdshot retinal choroiditis. Uh, most patients with this condition will require long-term therapy, either with the intravitreal implant of Redisert um, uh, or um, long-term therapy with immunomodulatory agents such as Celsept, cyclosporin, and or um, low-dose prednisone along with this. Sympathetic ophthalmia is almost invariably requires the use of immunomodulatory therapy with antimetabolites such as Imuran or, or even more aggressively with alkylating agents or sometimes combination therapy. Bechet's disease, as alluded to earlier, will require um, long-term immunomodulatory therapy and acute flare-ups of massive uh, uh, vasculitic flare-ups, as you see in the bottom left and bottom right screens here. Uh, sometimes these uh, flare-ups can look like necrotizing retinitis and can be indistinguishable from acute retinal necrosis syndrome or ne ne uh, necrotizing herpetic retinitis. In those cases of Bechet's that looks like that, those need to be aggressively managed with uh, anti-TNF therapy, as I mentioned earlier, with Remicade infusions. Vodkoyanagi Hirata syndrome in, in patients who have gone past the acute phases that you see on the top, but have de developed the chronic phase of disease and have chronic recurrent inflammation as the, as the patient in the bottom uh, row did, um, those patients will require immunomodulatory therapeutic agents. Necrotizing scleritis, this is often associated with systemic vasculitis. This patient is a patient of mine who had um, a um, evidence of um, relapsing polychondritis. Uh, with cartilaginous loss in the nose and the ears, this patient is going to die without appropriate uh, cytotoxic immunosuppressive therapy. She needed alkylating agents that were available in those days. Today, we use agents such as rituxan or infliximab uh, along with anti-metabolites um, to alleviate the risks associated with, uh, with some of the alkylating agents. Morin's ulcer, another one that is a corneal problem where we see uh, where we have to use um, uh, aggressive uh, immunomodulatory therapy. Here is a patient with peripheral ulcerative keratitis associated with um, positive uh, P anca test. They had micro, my, uh, my microscopic uh, polyangiitis. This patient required uh, uh, cytoxan uh, or cyclophosphamide therapy. So there are, these are the corneal indications uh, for immunomodulatory therapy, and I've mentioned already some of the, the posterior and pan uh, indications. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis is one that we didn't mention where we often use um, immunomodulatory therapy early. Uh, spe specifically, methotrexate is, uh, is an early agent that we use along with uh, topical corticosteroids to try to control inflammation in young children. So again, we've ruled out infection and now we try to treat the inflammation and steroids aren't enough, so then we use immunomodulatory therapy. Uh, so if somebody is requiring 20, 10, greater than 10 milligrams of prednisone to control their inflammation, they're gonna need immunosuppressive therapy. If somebody um, uh, is, is, is requiring, you know, every two week uh, periodic corticosteroid therapy and they're not responding, those patients probably will likely require aggressive intervention with immunomodulatory therapy. I'm a purist. I tend to use systemic agents much more frequently than I use local therapy, um, especially because I tend to see in my uveitis practice a lot more severe bilateral disease. Unilateral disease begs to be treated with local therapy, if at all possible, because it's one eye, the other eye is normal. But bilateral disease, generally, we tend to use immunomodulatory therapy much more commonly. What we don't know about is what agent to use, which is the best agent to use. We have some ideas but we don't know how long the therapy should continue. One of the questions is how long do I continue therapy? Well, immunosuppressive therapy I'm deeply sorry for this. It's a technical glitch of some kind. Um, let me um, go to the case where we were at here um, at the treatment paradigm. So we were talking about immunomodulatory therapy um, I hope you can, can you hear me? I hope you can uh, hear me okay. I'm uh, assuming that you can. I'll try to speak up to so you can hear me well. Um, let me. So immunomodulatory therapy, um, the, um, when we use this, there are numerous mechanisms of action. And this slide I like, it's from a, a, an old article that I had picked up from several years ago 
that kind of showed where all these agents act in the immune cascade. And looking specifically at the T cell, T cell, T helper cells are really kind of the main um, source of much of the inflammatory activity that we see in uh, non-infectious and even in infectious, but in non-infectious uveitis. Um, so um, I, I will, um, uh, corticosteroids, for example, work at the level of the antigen presenting cell, but also at the nuclear level and uh, nuclear transcription. Um, um, and also we have uh, the T cell inhibitors uh, such as cyclosporin and tacrolimus um, that uh, are calcineur calcineurin inhibitors that actually work indirectly uh, in terms of um, affecting the cell cycle. And then we have things like mycophenolate and azathioprine, which were very much involved in, uh, in uh, impacting um, uh, purine synthesis uh, that uh, have an effect on the uh, synthesis of DNA and rapidly replicating cells. So serolimus is um, a specific agent that we'll discuss a little bit more that has become more uh, interesting for, uh, uh, because it's now being tested as an intravitreal agent for the treatment of non-infectious uveitis. All of these things are uh, important, uh, agents are important to in the armamentarium um, of the treatment of inflammatory disease. Now in this slide, we don't have anything showing what the effect of TNF alpha inhibitors are, which are an important uh, um, uh, part of our armamentarium for the treatment of uh, ocular inflammatory disease. Um, the um, patients who are treated with immunomodulatory therapy, excuse me, I'm trying to get this slide to move here. Um, Patients who are treated with immunomodulatory therapy um, need to have baseline testing of CVC liver function tests. And in the case of azathioprine, sometimes I will use uh, the thiopurine, purine, excuse me, thiopurine methyltransferase activity determination. Uh, but generally, I, I've stopped doing that because it's an expensive test. But generally, I will uh, evaluate these patients monthly, complete blood counts and liver function tests. And I will uh, continue routinely monitoring these patients. Um, and once they're stable, on a stable dosage, I will reduce the frequency of these um, tests. Um, um, so let me ask the next question. Which immunosuppressive agent can be used safely in pregnancy? Methotrexate, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, or adalimumab? We didn't talk about any of these agents, but we will in a moment um, and discuss them. But um, methotrexate is an abortifacient. Obviously, you can't use it during pregnancy because it was used originally as an abortifacient uh, agent, so it induces abortion. Mycophenolate is not safe during pregnancy. Uh, and cyclophosphamide is certainly not safe during pregnancy because it's a cytotoxic agent. It's destructive to and severely, uh, profoundly neutropenic. Uh, inducing. And uh, so the safest agent actually are the TNF-alpha inhibitors. Remarkably, adalimumab is well tolerated in pregnancy and has um, uh, uh, can be used safely. And other agents that can be used with caution during pregnancy are uh, azathioprine and cyclosporin. So these are uh, important um, uh, agents to consider. Um, there are significant fetal or maternal risks uh, to, um, that we need to consider. Uh, so, you know, moderate to high fetal harm can come from cyclophosphamide, uh, methotrexate, um, mycophenolate, leflunamide, et cetera. Um, and selectively, we can use, as I mentioned, uh, some of these agents, specifically TNF inhibitors, azathioprine, et cetera. Corticosteroids can be used carefully during pregnancy as well with little risk to the fetus. Let's start talking a little bit about the antimetabolites. Methotrexate is probably the oldest of the antimetabolites. It's a dihydrofolate uh, reductase inhibitor, and it is in, impacts uh, directly the, the formation of thymidine. Um, and it's basically a folic acid analog. Um, but its anti-inflammatory activity is probably more uh, subtle than that. Actually, it's more complex. Um, and probably it's due to the extracellular release of adenosine that actually causes uh, the anti-inflammatory effect from methotrexate. It's given subcutaneously which or orally, but subcutaneously, and it's given weekly because it's a slow onset of action. It takes up to three to six months to have a full intraocular effect. And the dosage range is usually 15 to 25 milligrams per week. Um, 
And even children, I often use the full dosing of 25 milligrams a week to control as long as their liver function tests are tolerable. We know that from numerous studies, especially the um, site data, SITE studies are the um, um, therapeutic uh, studies, of retrospective therapeutic studies on the treatment um, of immunosuppressive therapy uh, for the treatment of non-infectious uveitis that we've been doing uh, in the United States uh, in multiple trials, multiple agents have specifically been evaluated. And methotrexate shows about a 66% um, uh, reduction in the need for, um, or ability to control, I should say, um, the um, um, uh, inflammation in patients with no inflammation at a year after therapy, and uh, more than half uh, have reduced the prednisone dosage to very relatively low levels. The good news about methotrexate is that it, there is no long-term uh, increased risk of neoplasia, and um, there's also appears to be um, a, um, uh, a, a, a uh, potential um, risk, uh, of course, with leukopenia, elevation of liver function tests, and uh, development of cirrhosis if it's not, and pulmonary fibrosis. And most of uh, these are unusual complications of the doses that we use, but these are potential risks. So patients should be monitored with CBCs and liver function tests when they're on these medications. There is, again, zero risk of long-term neoplasia. That's why this is safe to use in, in children. Uh, folic acid is usually used as a supplement to prevent side effects. And I tell patients with all immunosuppressives to avoid alcohol. Um, abstinence is important. Um, An appropriate contraception, uh, two dual forms of contraception should be utilized uh, by the women of childbear childbearing age and, and, um, and even for three months after discontinuing the medications because of its um, profound effect uh, on uh, uh, oogenesis, spermatogenesis as well. There's significant potential for uh, sperm mutation for up to four months off of drug. So patients who are on this, um, both men and women should um, uh, practice appropriate contraception and avoid, obviously avoid um, uh, trying to get pregnant on these medications. Uh, azathioprine is another common uh, anti-metabolite. It is a, um, and basically inhib it inhibits de novo purine synthesis and, and uh, it incorporates a nonsensical um, uh, nucleotide into DNA that stops DNA replication uh, and as a result uh, stops replication of rapidly dividing cells. Uh, it's been around for, um, for 40 plus years uh, and, and used, in, or used in organ transplantation can be used effectively for the treatment of um, uh, patients who have autoimmune and non-infectious uveitis. We, um, we used to obtain um, thiopurine methyl transferase um, uh, enzyme activity levels. Uh, it's known that um, most patients tolerate azathioprine well, but about 11% of patients have a deficiency, uh, a heterozygous deficiency and mild deficiency in the activity of this enzyme, which is important for the metabolism of the, uh, uh, of, of, um, uh, uh, and, uh, of this agent. And so toxic levels can develop if TPMT is not available, if not available in appropriate amounts for, from, uh, so we need to do either a dose adjustment or avoid MUN altogether in these patients who have deficiency of TPMT. Uh, there are some patients who are homozygous deficient, uh, and they really have no activity of TPMT, a very minimal activity, and they cannot tolerate azathioprine at all. Uh, the typical doses are between 100 to 200 milligrams a day, and again, it takes three to six months to be effective, and about, again, two-thirds of patients who were on this medication uh, had no inflammation at a year, according to the site studies, and um, um, about a half also, similar to methotrexate, had a reduction in uh, the need for uh, corticosteroids, uh, uh, in terms of less than 10 milligrams per day. Headaches and nausea are common side effects. Leukopenia can be uh, potentially rapid and serious, especially in those patients who have TPMT mutations, uh, homozygous TPMT mutations, so I it would avoid that. Elevation liver enzymes can occur in those patients who have TPMT mutations as well. And there is some potential for long-term increase in malignancy, although this is not clearly demonstrated in the site studies. Mycophenolate is one of my favorite agents because the side effect profile, the most common side effect, it's an it's a in, in, uh, inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase inhibitor. And it's interesting that in this IMPDH, this particular enzyme, um, it appears that CellCept is about um, five times uh, more, has five times more affinity to binding this enzyme in activated T cells. So it's very specific, it's kind of knocks out rapidly dividing T cells uh, and, uh, and it selectively does so. And that's what makes it a very attractive agent theoretically. And I find that this is well tolerated. The most common side effect of patients who are on my mycophenolate is diarrhea. 
18 uh, percent can develop this and usually it's because how they take it or the dose so we can do dose adjustment and adjust how patients are on this medication. But nearly three quarters of patients on this medicine didn't have inflammation after a year of its use. And more than a half were able to reduce their prednisone doses less than 10 milligrams a day. And it has excellent evidence for uh, preventing rejection in organ transplantation as well. So this is a great agent to use. Um, leukopenia uh, is a, uh, uh, rare progressive multi uh, multifocal leukoencephalopathy and long-term malignancy are potential risks that are quite rare and idiosyncratic, but they need to be considered uh, in uh, when they use these agents. Again, we monitor the patient the same way. The typical dose for adults is a thousand uh, to two thousand. Excuse me, thousand milligrams BID or fifteen hundred milligrams BID. So two thousand to three thousand milligrams uh, daily cumulative dose of, of mycophenolate is what we utilize. I use less of cyclosporin than I used to in the 1990s uh, since the since uh, Cellcept or mycophenolate became available, but it's a cyclosporin um, and tacrolimus are both calcineurin inhibitors. Um, they bind um, uh, cyclophilin uh, and this is actually um, uh, uh, prevents the, um, uh, the nuclear factor uh, from getting into the uh, nucleus that results in uh, uh, the um, um, activation of the IL-2 gene and the production of, uh, you know, uh, large amounts of mRNA and uh, replication of uh, rapidly dividing T cells uh, and production of cytokines. So it has a significant uh, anti-inflammatory effect in, by multiple mechanisms. Um, but it is a T cell inhibitor uh, and it really inhibits the production of a T activated T cell cytokines from activated T cells. So it really has a significant effect in controlling inflammation. The site data is not as impressive as the other agent. About half had no inflammation that year when using this agent, um, and only about a third were able to reduce prednisone doses less than 10 milligrams. And again, it's used, you know, tacrolimus especially is utilized for organ transplant recip uh, 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 recipients to prevent rejection. The dosage of cyclosporin, I usually use less than five milligrams per kilogram per day. When it's used in conjunction with other agents, such as Cellcept or Imuran, I may, or azathioprine, I may utilize uh, one to two and a half milligrams per kilogram per day uh, to avoid some of the side effects and try to reduce the other agent as well. So when used in combination, these agents have to, the dose adjustments have to be lower. So you have the combined effect of both of those agents with fewer side effects. There are lots of side effects with cyclosporin, hirsutism, uh, uh, re reduction of creatinine, creatinine clearance, uh, and we don't, we used to measure drug levels with radio amino assay for cyclosporin. Now, we typically will just measure um, renal function uh, to determine if there's renal toxicity. Hypertension, uh, trembling or shaking the hands, paresthesias, acne, oily skin, gingival hyperplasia, these are all known side effects uh, of this. Serolimus is interesting. It's an immunoregulatory agent. It's similar to ta uh, tacrolimus and cyclosporin, but it's, it targets the other half, uh, other side of that, um, the, um, um, the uh, cyclophilin um, pathway uh, in, it, in terms of how it, act the, it, it, uh, 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 it attaches to the nuclear factor uh, activating um, uh, target. That, in that situation, what, what happens with serolimus is that it inhibits the activity of serine and threonine protein kinase and mammalian target, target of rapamycin or mTOR. And so when it does that, it has a very specific inflammatory effect, just like inactivated T cells, just like the cyclosporin, uh, cyclophilin binding does. And it results in a reduction of inflammatory cytokine uh, uh, release. So it's very effective when it's given intravitrally, according to the Sakura phase three trial. So we're very excited that this may be very effective in the treatment of intermediate posterior panuveitis uh, as an intravitreal injection given every two, two months or so. Uh, so this is a very exciting new area that's just uh, 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 kind of on the verge of um, breakthrough here uh, soon. And it may change how we treat chronic uveitic disease. Um, alkylating agents such as cyclophosphamide are utilized in the most severe cases, usually systemic vasculitis, necrotizing scleritis is a good example. Um, as you know, cytoxan, for example, is, a, is basically a, uh, prevents DNA cross, uh, results in DNA cross-linking in the development of, and, and cell death and uh, apoptosis of, of rapidly dividing cells. Um, it causes uh, localized protein damage as well. Uh, one of the um, um, uh, byproducts of uh, the uh, metabolites of uh, cyclophosphamide is acrolein, which is actually the thing that causes toxicity, specifically bladder toxicity. 
So let me ask a poll question here. What is the highest rate of durable remission of disease is most likely to be achieved by use of which agent? Chlorambucil, infliximab, cyclosporin, and prednisone. This is an interesting question. We talk about a lot of different agents, but which are really the most effective in reduce, causing durable remission? That is, no um, you know, inflammation off of medications. So that's durable remission uh, and being free of inflammation on no medication. And the let's see what you guys all thought. So it's kind of, um, yeah, nobody chose the agent that's the right answer. So this is interesting. So the, if you look at chronic and, uh, inflammatory, uh, non-infectious inflammatory disease, cytoxin and chlorambucil, the alkylating agents, have the greatest and highest rate of durable remission. Infliximab and, and uh, adalimumab, in my experience, are very, very good at controlling inflammation, but they, it takes a long time to reach if we can reach durable remission of disease. And stopping the agent is always, um, you know, is associated with significant trepidation. Um, but with chlorambucil and cyclophosphamide, the rates of durable remission are much, much higher than they are with any of the other agents listed. Isn't that interesting? So I, you, all of you got that, uh, got that wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, so cyclophosphamide is usually given at 100 to 150 milligrams daily. These agents, um, I will give myself in some cases, but often I will have a rheumatologist and or oncologist involved because these are very, very risky agents to utilize. They are available more readily, um, and, um, but, but the, they have to be used very carefully. In India, I know that they use intravenous pulse therapy of cytoxin every month for six to 12 months at 500 to 1,000 milligrams IV. But when you look at the target leukocyte counts and try to really dumb down the leukocyte counts to low levels of um, three to 4,000 cells per microliter and then off of all steroids and then taper them off the medications, tapered uh, uh, or uh, stop. Uh, we we wanna try to keep the maximum cumulative dose of cyclophosphamide down to 35 milligrams or less, because after 35 milligrams of cumulative dose, that's about six months of therapy at the oral dosing, um, the risk of secondary leukemia substantially increases. And look at the site data, 76% had no inflammation at a year and almost two thirds could reduce prednisone to less than 10 milligrams a day. Um, the oral form of cyclophosphamide is associated with a greater risk of hemorrhagic cystitis because of acrolein uh, metabolite being more prominent in the systemic circulation. Um, Cyclorambucil is a, another alkylating agent, but it's, it forms, um, it also causes cross-linking DNA and inhibition of DNA replication, but it has a longer duration effect. Um, and in short-term high-dose therapy or long-term low-dose therapy can be utilized, and there, there's uh, significant information on um, um, the utilization of this, uh, um, uh, of this uh, uh, short-term high-dose therapy, which has been very effective um, from the University of uh, Illinois and Northwestern University from Deborah Goldstein's group. The um, complications for these agents are severe. Opportunistic infections are quite common, so pneumocystis carinii prophylaxis is recommended. Um, hemorrhagic cystitis from encyclophosphamide because of acrolein. Uh, can, can also increase the risk of bladder cancer development. Uh, leukopenia and bone marrow suppression is common, pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis, and secondary leukemias and lymphomas are also important, and permanent sterility can occur. So patients who are on these agents probably should consider, especially men, sperm banking. Um, biologic response modifiers are expensive agents. Um, they're used by uveitis specialists um, uh, usually in conjunction with rheumatologists. Very rarely do we use these on our own, but now adalimumab has been approved by the FDA for use of, in non-infectious uveitis. And then these are, I consider them second line immunosuppressive agents. I don't go immediately to adalimumab unless I failed one of the other uh, anti-metabolites um, or immunosuppressors. So there are numerous biologic response modifiers. You can see that the list continues to grow on an annual basis. But for our purposes, the top two that you see on the bottom, uh, uh, excuse me, on the, on the top right of the slide, the infliximab and adalimumab are the most important. Um, and then we also have rituximab, which are CD20 inhibitors, signaling induction inhibitors. These are very uh, important um, in the treatment of certain severe vasculitic conditions.
Um, we, you know, we know that the rationale for use in ocular inflammatories is based on rheumatology tr um, clinical trials, but more recently we've had some excellent clinical studies, uh, uh, especially uh, for uh, adalimumab um, conducted by Abbey Pharmaceuticals on its efficacy in the treatment of non-infectious uveitis. The dosing and duration of therapy and agent of choice is really empiric um, and uh, based on patient tolerability as well. So the tumor necrosis factor is, signals other inflammatory cytokines and it's kind of an upstream regulatory um, cytokine itself. So um, it's released by activated CD4 cells or T helper cells. And it's really important for the ultimate release of interleukin-1 and other pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, and anti-inflammatory cytokines that are, that are present. So regulation of TNF uh, is, um, is an, an important um, um, aspect of inflammatory control in the eye. Adalimumab is a completely humanized IgG um, uh, uh, one molecule that targets um, the um, soluble TNF um, as well as membrane-bound uh, TNF um, um, alpha. So these are, this is a, a very useful um, agent for the treatment. Um, uh, and infliximab it has a slight variation in, in it's kind of a both, it's a chimeric antibody, where, whereas adalimumab is completely humanized. The infliximab has a variable region that is actually murine or mouse derived. Um, we don't use etanercept. We used to think that it was useful. Um, it, it is useful probably for joint disease, but it has no effect on the treatment of uveitis. Some people believe it actually may potentiate the development of uveitis, so we do not use etanercept. Infliximab and adalimumab are the agents that we used most commonly. Now, again, FDA, adalimumab has been FDA approved for the treatment of non-infectious um, intermediate posterior and pan-uveitis. Um, we have to be very careful with the use of the agents and, and you should have a rheumatologist involved, obviously, in, in dispensing these and treating the patients because the, some of them require infusions such as at, uh, the uh, infliximab, um, hypersensitivity reaction, exacerbation of demyelinating disease, congestive heart failure, exacerbation of TB and latent TB is very important in third world countries, of course, uh, and uh, of course, um, uh, histoplasmosis in our neck of the woods. Um, and then drug-induced lupus and secondary neoplasia such as leukemia as have been reported with infliximab. Um, these are all important considerations and make these agents very um, significant departures from the anti-metabolites in terms of the side effect profile. So these should not be taken lightly. And I think involvement of an internist, uh, a rheumatologist is very important. Rituximab is an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody. It's a chimeric antibody and is directed against CD20 positive B lymphocytes. It's very effective in uh, where B lymphocytes are involved and they're producing a lot of antibody, for example, in immune complex diseases like, such as vasculitis. It's going to be highly effective. They have a profound and dramatic effect in, uh, in systemic vascular disease, refractory scleritis, and orbital inflammation. There's lots of ophthalmic evidence uh, to show this efficacy here. And, but the complications can be profound lymphopenia, hypersensitivity reaction, and infusion reactions. These are, these are agents that definitely need to be given by an oncologist or, or a rheumatologist. There are other agents that we, um, you know, that have limited utility in uveitis, such as abetacept or orencia, which is a cytokine receptor blockade agent. It blocks, um, you know, um, uh, this fusion protein for CTLA-4. Um, and interferons uh, can be utilized in Europe. They tend to be utilized much more commonly uh, than they are in the United States. And I have little experience with the use of interferon alpha-2 uh, for the treatment of uveitis, uh, but it is very helpful in intermediate uveitis associated with cystoid macular edema. If you read some of the articles by um, Dr. Jim Rosenbaum and his groups in, uh, in Oregon. There are now new agents, the T-helper 17 inhibitors that are coming up that have probably a great role to play in the future. Um, in the uh, control of autoimmune disease um, by inhibiting interleukin-17. These IL-17 inhibitors, um, specifically secukinumab, has shown some um, very significant um, uh, positive uh, effects on controlling inflammation. So this is kind of a nutshell overview of what we have available in our armamentarium for the treatment of inflammation. Um, I'm gonna stop share of uh, the, uh, I'm gonna take some Q and A's, um, the, um, um, and I apologize that, uh, that I cut out. I had some internet connectivity problems uh, and it's, it's been fixed at this point. Um, so um, I, I'm actually running a little late um, and I have um, a, um, 
uh, conference that I have to go to. Um, but I, I hope that I've answered some of the questions. I don't see a whole lot of Q and A's here. Let me see if I have any, do you all have any questions that I can quickly answer? I'm not seeing any questions coming up here. Um, I uh, hope that um, that you were able to uh, get some useful information from this. Um, and uh, uh, if there's, um, I think I, I'm gonna uh, take a look at the a few questions that um, um, that was sent to me yesterday. Um, uh, what is the role of topical cyclosporin? Um, uh, Okay, Fuchs uveitis. Fuchs uveitis, you know, Fuchs iridocyclitis uh, does not require immunosuppressive therapy and should not re be treated with corticosteroids. Um, the um, um, uh, the, the um, um, I will say that uh, in those cases, uh, patients have a 50% chance of developing cataracts or glaucoma. Corticosteroids should be avoided. C cataract surgery can be done um, in Fuchs patients without preoperative treatment with uh, corticosteroids. Um, and this disease really does not require immunosuppressive therapy of any kind. Um, so the, we'll, uh, this, this is a, a disease that um, has, does not produce structural complications from chronic inflammation other than cataracts and glaucoma. Um, the, um, uh, let me, let me, okay, so let me just go on here. Um, alternatives to IMTS. I'm not sure what IMTS stands for. Um, uh, let me, let me answer a couple of other questions here and I'll come back to that one. Um, how long should we continue corticosteroids? I, I mentioned uh, that, you know, corticosteroids, um, once the inflammation has, uh, has been controlled, these need to be gradually tapered over a period of eight to 12 weeks. If we're talking about topical corticosteroids. Um, the, um, um, when can we stay softly, safely stop uh, the um, immunosuppressives in posterior panuveitis? Well, you know, we can safely stop immunosuppressives, as I said, at three to five years after, in my opinion, after controlled inflammation, a minimum of two years uh, after there's no inflammation. Um, the um, immunomodulatory therapy for chronic uveitis, um, you know, again, is for granulomatous inflammation, uh, it's variable. I think it's a idiosyncratic and very highly patient dependent selection of agent. It's an empiric selection. There's no raw data to suggest this is the agent that you should use. Um, infectious uveitis should not be treated with immunosuppressives, obviously. Um, how do you fight recurrence of uveitis? Well, treat the acute uveitic condition aggressively and for a significant duration of time and make the inflammation go away at, uh, at the risk of overtreatment so you can prevent recurrences. Um, developing countries' treatment options are limited. Corticosteroids are readily available. Some of the older immunosuppressives, such as methotrexate and imuran, may be available. I know that this is a huge problem um, because many of you will see mo the most severe diseases and those that are the most economically disadvantaged. Um, I, you know, the um, obviously the uh, if if nothing else is available, uh, corticosteroids can be utilized. Uh, uh, effectively, I think, in the vast majority of cases to control inflammation. And I think that if we realize that acute inflammatory disease, if it's aggressively treated with steroids and brought under control, generally goes on to do well in, in our hands, especially anterior uveitis. It's those patients that are inadequately treated, in my opinion, with too rapid a taper of steroids that result in chronic problems. Um, um, so the, um, let, me, let me just see a few other questions here. Um, uh, see, some there. Here's a question. Um, uh, the um, I have two questions. First one about uh, Bechet's disease. What is your first line therapy? Um, cyclosporin uh, again, explosive onset Bechet's disease. I typically will recommend uh, with posterior segment inflammation that TNF inhibitors such as infliximab or uh, be utilized. Um, and high dose oral corticosteroids or IV corticosteroids um, if infliximab is not available. Uh, IV corticosteroids followed by uh, a gradual taper of oral corticosteroids, and I would um, use Imuran uh, 
um, because imiran in the Japanese studies has been shown to be probably a little bit more effective than cyclosporin, but cyclosporin is fine as well. My, my problem on cyclosporin is that I've been able to, um, not able to taper patients off of cyclosporin. It almost behaves like a steroid, but with similar kinds of side effects. Uh, so I don't use cyclosporin as much. Um, so Humira is an excellent agent to switch to if you're not having good effect with, uh, with cyclosporin if it's available. Uh, can we do refractive surgery after controlling idiopathic anti-uveitis? You know, I tell patients who have um, uh, uveitis, uh, anti-uveitis, um, that cataract surgery potentially can cause their disease to recur even if they're quiet. I tell patients, I'm very conservative, I tell patients that uh, elective surgeries um, potentially carry that risk. Uh, now, corneal surgeries alone, I suppose, can be done, but I would counsel the patient. I don't think this is going to be necessarily straightforward. Um, so um, I would be very cautious in recommending such um, aggressive kind of, you know, more um, uh, elective surgical procedures such as refractive surgery. Um, uh, do I give um, periocular corticosteroids for patients with fuchs complaining of floaters or having a flare of vitritis? Um, vitreous surgery may be more effective in that setting, um, but uh, yes, you can try that. But remember, these patients are at high risk for glaucoma. Corticosteroids can help reduce symptoms. Sometimes people have with fuchs and pain, can have floaters. Uh, corticosteroids can be used, but remember that 50% get glaucoma uh, and 50% get cataract. So you're gonna make cataracts and glaucoma worse with corticosteroids. So I would use these steroid agents gingerly. Perhaps you can use diflupredinate, which can penetrate the, into the anterior vitreous and control some vitreous cells. That might be um, useful. Um, uh, there's in resource poor countries, what uh, immunosuppressive therapies, how do we monitor if we don't readily have such investigations? Well, a complete blood counts and liver function tests should be readily available. These are routine tests that should be available practically anywhere in the world. Now, uh, you know, a CBC, uh, you can get a hemoglobin or hematocrit or a, and a white blood cell count. That can be, I think that that can be easily obtained. Liver function tests should be obtainable. Um, if you don't have access to these, you are going to take some chances because I think monitoring, not monitoring the patient on immunosuppressive therapy is very risky. Um, herpetic uveitis long-term control, I use systemic um, um, anti, antipiral therapy. Usually I use Valtrex, 1,000 milligrams daily maintenance, or acyclovir, 800 milligrams twice daily maintenance. Um, azathioprine, immunomodulatory therapy, yes. Good agent, azathioprine can be utilized um, uh, for for the, especially in conditions like a Bechet's disease, but it has an uh, excellent uh, immuno, um, um, uh, immunosuppressive effect and util utilized between 100 to 200 uh, milligrams daily. Uh, and this, again, three, it takes three to six months to take effect and use for a few years. What is the role of glaucoma shunt surgery in uveitis management? Um, this is beyond the scope of this talk because, you know, I have lots of questions about uveitis because I know, and perhaps we should have a lecture on the complications of uveitis, and I will see if I can put that together for you. Um, but, uh, you know, inflammation in any time surgery is considered in uveitis patients with chronic uveitis, inflammation has to be as well controlled as possible with essentially no cells in the anterior chamber and whatever it takes to get to that level keep them at that level with no cells with that level of medications, even if it's high doses of steroids and prednisone, keep them at that for three months, and then you can safely do glaucoma uh, surgery. In uveitic patients, tube shunts work better than trabeculectomy, in my experience, and that's what I usually prefer. What are the other surgical options for management of chronic uveitis? Well, chronic vitritis can be taken care of with vitrectomy, but remember that these are temporizing measures. Um, these have... Um, if you've done everything, control the, the inflammation and vitreous opacities remain when it's therapeutic and highly effective. But if you've not done everything to control inflammation, you're probably buying more trouble than it's worth. So surgical options are limited for uveitic patients. Um, in terms of surgical options for implanting the corticosteroid implant, such as Redisert, yes, that's very effective in controlling inflammation as a surgical option. Uh, for chronic idiopathic anterior uveitis, again, duration of steroid therapy, it's chronic. Chronic diseases, do you stop treatment for chronic hypertension? Do you stop treatment for chronic diabetes? No. So you don't stop treatment for chronic idiopathic anterior uveitis. If the patient has chronic disease, it's not gonna go away. So you need to find the lowest dose of chronic of topical corticosteroids that are going to uh, keep the uh, inflammation well controlled. Um, 
who is a purist? A purist. I'm a by purist. I mean, I'm not a guy that likes to use um, local therapy as much. I like to use systemic therapy, especially with bilateral chronic disease, uh, the, because of the nature of my practice. All of you are not going to be seeing the kinds of patients that I may see because I'm a UVI specialist. The, the, but the chronic, really severe conditions require systemic immunosuppressive therapy to control. What is the best antibiotic therapy for toxoplasmosis? Somebody's asked me. I still think pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine combination is best, but clindamycin is an, uh, an appropriate alternative. Intravitreal clindamycin is also an excellent alternative. Um, mass grade syndrome, retina, retinal, retinitis dysfigmentosa, yes, can produce with uh, what appears to be occlusive, occluded vessels, et cetera. Uh, and these patients don't respond to immunosuppressive therapy. So, um, I think here idiopathic uveitis can be treated with chemotherapy. Yes, idiopathic uveitis, as long as it's not infectious, can definitely be treated with immunosuppressive therapy, but you need corticosteroids to control the inflammation initially and then start immunosuppression. Retinal detachment of chronic uveitis is managed with the same vitreoretinal techniques that you use for, um, for ordinary uh, detachments, but I tend to be more aggressive in avoiding uh, cryotherapy I tend to use um, you know, vitrectomy combined with scleral buckling surgery more because these patients tend to have more risk of PVR, proliferative vitreotinopathy development. So I'm more aggressive. I'm a retina specialist as well. So I do a lot of PVR surgery in uveitic patients. So um, I will try to see if we can maybe put together a lecture with, uh, I'll talk to Orbis uh, um, folks and see if we can get that to happen. Uh, uh, to, how would you manage these patients? Well, yeah, with miserable vision, yes. I, these are very, very difficult conditions to manage. And if you can't do it yourself, you have to seek out help from an, a person trained in ocular inflammatory diseases, such as a uveitis specialist or a retina specialist to help you. I have to go. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I look forward to interacting with you folks again soon. Good night. Good day.